Good morning and welcome to St. Peter's. We're glad that you are here this morning to worship our Lord together. If you would, stand. And we're going to read Psalm 16 together to guide us to the doorstep of worship this morning. As we say together, we read, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's worship. I search the world
ourselves this morning. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. We remind ourselves that there's nothing. Nothing better.
that bridge back up. The all prayer, or no, I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down. And I'm not going to ask the band to play it. I found that this really hard to sing today and believe it. And sometimes it's hard. And if that's you, I want you to know you're in the right spot. You're okay. It's okay. It's okay to have a hard time saying, I lay my whole life down before you to put all your trust in him. I'm having a hard time with it right now. And that's okay. Because we show up and that's why we enter into a time of prayer together. So if that's where you are, you're not alone. So I'm gonna invite us into a time of prayer. We're gonna use this, this collect, this prayer from the Book of Common Prayer for the second Sunday of Lent that Anglican churches all over the world have the option of using. So when we're praying this, we're not just praying this together in this room. We're praying this worldwide. So let's pray this as we enter into a time of prayer. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls that we may be defended from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you to take whatever posture, to close your eyes if you want to. You can reach out your hands. Sometimes AJ has us put our hands with our palms facing down. Symbolize, look, I'm, I'm letting something go. And I want you to just think for a moment. think for a moment that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. What am I holding on to that I need to just let go? Where am I trying to pull myself out of a rut that I need to let go? And then friends, I want to ask you, if you have your hands turned over, to turn them over and face them up. Just as a symbol. Lord, I've got no power and I need you and I receive you. And folks, I'm talking to me every bit as much as I am to you. And friends, if you'll join me in this prayer on the screen. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. Through your son, Jesus, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And friends, so if you're like me and you're having a hard time singing that bridge this morning, it's okay, and it's okay because of what we just prayed right there. We talk to God and we're honest, and then we can find peace that seems otherwise out of reach, and we can share it with other people. So friends, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's take a moment. Let's greet those around each other. Meet somebody you don't know. Pass the peace of Christ. We'll call you back in just a minute.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Peter's Church. My name is Turner. If we have not had a chance to meet, I'm one of the pastors on staff here. And we have a lot of new people coming through our doors, new to this church. And if that is you and you would like to meet, grab me as I'm running by or grab one of us as we're running by because we'd love to talk to you. We don't want you to leave here feeling like you didn't get to talk to anybody. Um, I want to highlight some opportunities we, opportunities we have to connect and grow as a community. Um, just to highlight a few things and point them out. First up, we have something called Jesus and Technology. We've done a few of these in this cultural series. This particular one is going to be on March 6th at 6 o'clock. And we're going to have a conversation around what would Jesus have to say about technology? Why does it matter? So join us for that Wednesday. Our goal for these series is to address cultural trends as a church and think about them from a biblical standpoint to shape the wider conversation. So if you need child care for that, uh, please reach out to Katie Williams. We can get that set up. Um, the student ministry is going to meet in the barn, the, the same as usual there, but this is going to be a great night, and we hope that you will join us for this important conversation. Also, we have coming up on March 1st, the father-daughter or the grandfather-granddaughter or the big brother and the little sister. I might have just added that one in and I might pay for it later. Um, but we have this dance and it's going to be fantastic. Today is the last day to register. And this is actually the official last day. I think we've kind of false started the last day to register a couple times. Today is the last day to register. I'll be there with my daughter. We're going to be boogieing. And, um, and I'm going to be embarrassing myself, and it's going to be awesome. And I want all, all the dads, all the parent guardians to join me there. So last day to sign up for that. Also, starting this Friday, we have a number, if you are new here, we have a number of things going on at any given moment for men and for women. This Friday, we have a new study starting for men. Um, it is going to be Friday morning, 7 to 8, 15 in this room. We are going to be studying Philippians. Um, breakfast is provided. Provided. We usually have about 30 guys. I think AJ is going to lead us through this one. We, we are kind of sharing the load through this. So we hope you will join us for that. And also for women and men, if Fridays don't work for you, there are a number of other studies. Grab a sheet from outside or you can look on our website. There are a number of things going on. Um, and as always, we are super grateful for the radical generosity of this church and the way that y'all help support God's mission and ministries that we feel like is working through here. And now through July, if you would like to give to our expansion vision, which, which we call ESI, Every Square Inch, our expansion vision of our property, you can designate that to ESI. And now as our reader comes forward, I'd like to invite us all to open our hearts, open our minds, and let's prepare ourselves for God's word. Our gospel reading comes from Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Our teaching text comes from Genesis 4. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. The word of the Lord. God. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's good to be together this morning. Um, Jonathan Sachs was arguably the most influential rabbi of the 20th century. Uh, but he wasn't always a rabbi. Discerning a career in law or economics while at Cambridge, he took a summer to travel in the midst of his undergraduate. And he wanted to meet as many rabbis as he could. And so he was on this quest at a young age to learn from the best Jewish thinkers 
who were beginning to respond in the 50s to the rise of atheism. And so he books a flight to the United States and comes over. And this one rabbi's name, as he was in conversations, kept coming up over and over again. And the rabbi's name was Rabbi Schneerson. And this rabbi had done something super unusual. He had turned the normally inward Hasidic Jews outward, sending them to campuses in small communities, these sort of places that had never encountered Jewish orthodoxy, which is like the most conservative and orthodox and sort of traditional mode of Judaism as there is at this time and at that time as well. And so people everywhere began to, to speak of Rabbi Snearsom as this incredible prodigy. So wanting to meet him, young Jonathan, he goes to Brooklyn and people laughed in his face. The rabbi was too busy to meet with a college student, they would say. And so he left his number anyway, and he said, listen, if he can talk, he, I can be reached in L.A. in a week from now. So he takes a bus out to L.A., and weeks later, the phone rings, and it's the rabbi from Brooklyn. And he said, I can see you for a few minutes this Thursday, if you can come back. So he immediately packs his case. He books a cross-country Greyhound bus, and he goes to the meeting, makes it to Thursday night, and in the middle of the conversation, he was gripped by the way in which this rabbi surprised him for being so popular and so influential. Rabbi Schneerson had zero personality and zero charisma. In fact, Jonathan said he was so humble that he focused entirely all of his energy on Jonathan. And halfway into the conversation, he begins to perform this role reversal. And instead of taking questions, he begins to ask them. And he asked Jonathan this about life back in England. He says, how many Jewish students are there at Cambridge? And how many of them are actually engaged in Jewish life? To which Jonathan said about 10%. And then he goes and he, he fumbles a sentence, he says, and the sentence he fumbles goes something like this. In the situation in which I find myself, I don't know if you've ever been that, like sat with a really intimidating person and just like even talking becomes a challenge. And he goes, in, in, in the situation in which I find myself, and Rabbi Schneerson stops in mid-sentence and he says, whoa, 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 you do not find yourself in a situation. You put yourself in one. And if you can put yourself in one situation then you could put yourself in another. Something was wrong with the Jewish student life at Cambridge, and the rabbi was challenging him to do something about it. Now, what happened next forever changed the trajectory of Jonathan Sachs. And I'll tell it in just a few minutes. <laughs> We've been in this conversation about the curiosity of God starting last week, and it's going to move us through Lent, wondering about God's questions for us. In the scripture, and as we demonstrated some statistics last week, Jesus asked a lot more questions than his disciples asked him. That God has a way of becoming curious about us. And that's not for him. I think it's for us. It's for us to sort of poke around our own souls and not just sort of drift through life, but to gain clarity and to gain purpose. For us to be fully aware, as Mary Oliver puts it, as we live this one wild and precious life that we have. For us not to just sort of zone out and coast through. And so we ponder today this question that comes out of Genesis 4. Last week we looked at Genesis 3, where are you? And began to wonder how God maybe is not interested in geography as much as God is interested in our identity and us becoming very clear about where we are in life, who we are in life, becoming curious about ultimate questions and not just kind of like taking cultural scripts and living them out and calling that a good life. To become aware of who we are and where we're going. Today the question is a little bit different. The text reads this in Genesis 4. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, or as the Jews say, Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now that's interesting. The blood of 
Abel has a voice. Fascinating. Very get-go in the text. Scripture speaks very mysteriously here. Your brother's blood, it cries out to me from the ground. And now you are under a curse. So this, this blood sort of spoke a curse. And you are driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So as far as we know, this is the first murder that we have in human history. And it wouldn't be the last. By the end of this chapter, I mean, you don't even get all the way through Genesis 4. You get to the end of this chapter, and a few generations later, listen to this. Lamech said to his wives, I have killed a man. So here we go. More murders happening. You don't even get through a chapter here. A young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Vengeance, murder. Do do you remember what Jesus later said about forgiveness? When they asked him, do I forgive seven times? And Jesus says, what? No, you forgive 77 times. Do you hear? I wonder if Jesus has this text in the back of his head while this question is being asked, that the pattern that you see of unforgiveness and anger that got us into this mess will be unraveled and the curse is broken through the, through the breakthrough of forgiveness. You just wonder if Jesus was thinking about this text, another conversation, another time. What we find in Genesis 4 is the expansive pattern of murder. The sort of unfolding and unspiraling of God's intent for this world. And it's been with us ever since. Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon, Hitler. Same pattern over and over and over. And every generation today we see it unfolding this pattern in Ukraine. We see it in the Middle East. We see it in our elementary schools and on and on and on. We are all connected to the pattern of the story that we see all the way from Genesis 4 in the narrative of Cain. I know we think we're individuals and that we're living unique lives and we're detached from the past. Y'all, we are engrafted into an ever unfolding story that goes all the way back to Genesis We see these same patterns habituated and encultured today that we saw all the way back then. Now, maybe you're thinking to myself, I am not a murderer, so let's get your facts straight, preacher. I have never murdered anyone to which Jesus comes along and responds to that. In the greatest sermon ever preached, he says that you have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, right, But I say to you, this rabbi with shmikah that we've looked at before with authority, but I say to you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. That according to Jesus, the pattern of Cain lives somewhere in me and somewhere in you. The scriptures get really interesting when we refuse to reduce them to ancient history and we begin finding ourselves in them. We find ourselves in the story. Their lives are our lives. Different generation, different context. Same plot, same struggle, same invitation. And that's why we look at these questions. Where is your brother? Where is your sister? This is a hard teaching. This is a hard text. The question is, where is your brother? Can you locate him? Not just like, do you have one? That's theory. Locate them. God doesn't say who's your, he says where. I want to know where your brother is because I'm assuming you got one and you're abdicating any sort of responsibility for the blood that you just shed. Where is he? I want you to find him because you've lost yourself along the way. I want to suggest that we're invited to think through this question, where is your brother, at least through three directions. I'll be brief this morning. The first has to do with our neighbors. When we think about who is your brother, who is your sister, I think the first place it begins is this idea of understanding what scriptures talk about loving our neighbor. When Jesus talks about loving our neighbor, who does he mean? What does that mean? We always have to start locally, not theoretically. One of the greatest problems in the American church today is we leave things in the land of theory in the land of abstraction. 
of this ideas about God without actually getting clear about these questions of what, what does love demand of me? What does this response to the love of Jesus require from me to live in his pattern, to live in his way, to undo the patterns that I receive from the culture of this world? So we have to start locally. This isn't grad school. This is saying, what does it mean to live well? And so I suggest that who your neighbor is, is the everyday people around which you live, where you work, and where you worship. Look around. These are your neighbors. Today when you go home, those are your neighbors. Tomorrow at work, those are your neighbors. It's very easy to discern. It's not abstract. It's not difficult. And when history remembers the 21st century in five words, I wonder what they will be. I am convinced that one of those five words for our time period is disconnected. Fundamentally disconnected for a myriad reasons. But we talk a lot about this around here. We talk a lot about living intentionally, seeing people, being aware of how we sort of um, veer into certain ways of living that, that disconnect us from other people. Sometimes consciously so, other times unconsciously so. I don't want to talk a lot about this because we talk a lot about it and I don't want to drone on, but we want everyone in this church to be able to answer the question, where is your brother? Where is your sister? To have names, to have faces. And we're not talking about strictly the biological family tree. We're also talking about the spiritual family tree. And if you can't answer that this morning, we would just say, welcome to church. We'd like to help. There are so many ways to connect here. And Turner's already mentioned some of them, but any male in this room, I would invite you for a gender that is known for our disconnection. Join me Friday. We'd love to see you here. Let's share breakfast. Cecil is cooking, and it's not going to be Raisin Bran. He and his clan do so much more than a fruit medley. It's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Where is your brother? Second sort of, I think, direction we should pay attention to you can see that as the pattern, the expansive pattern of anger and murder moves out, there's this expansive invitation as well to begin to see where our brothers are, not just in our neighbors and those around us, but to expand that circle into thinking about our enemies. And this is really hard. What was Cain's vocation? Does anyone remember? Bueller? Cain? He was a shepherd. Took care of the livestock. And what was... Abel's vocation. He was a farmer. Took care of the land. You can see how this might eventually conflict. This is my grass. My sheep have to eat. Graze them somewhere else. But they're starving. You understand how that might happen? How there could potentially be some conflict somewhere. So on and so forth. Human history is the story of small arguments brewing into civil war. That, that's history in a nutshell. Like we've all got these stories in our own life where something so small snowballed into something rather large. And I think this is why Jesus is so clear about trying to settle matters quickly because small fires can take down an entire forest. It's kind of like that. I love the words of Mother Teresa here. Sorry for the long quote, but it's worth it. People are often unreasonable, illogical, self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of being selfish or ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you will win some false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness... They may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway.
enemies are hard to like expand our capacity to do something different than the pattern of this world gives us. It's really hard. You've been hurt. And the healing is slow. I know. You've been wronged. And you want an apology. I know. You've been ignored. Or passed over. Or put down. I know. There have been times where I've been so wounded by people and I've tried to forgive time and again but pray God I can't and every time I sense this response from God I know but I can and together we will the blood of Abel cries out this curse. But the blood of Jesus cries out a blessing. And it sounds cliche, only that it's true. In our weakness, he is strong, y'all. Like, it is possible to be set free from bitterness, to be transfigured from vengeance into the shape of loving your enemy. That's the difference of Jesus. It's the defining mark of the Jesus people. There's a practice that I use that really helps me with this, and it's the practice of blessing. Each morning, when I just can just sense that agitation in my soul or sense something from my past that's just like getting in the way of, of peace and joy... There's often a, a circumstance or something that's happened that, um, that requires for me to do this practice, and it's just blessing by name. Then when God says to me, AJ, where's your brother? It's like, I actually want you to locate them in your mind, and I want you to intentionally bless them and do it until you mean it. And it's been really freeing for me to just give them to the Lord that I don't have to carry that anymore. And I'm going to come back to this in 10 minutes probably again, in two hours, and tomorrow, and just continue to bless and bless and bless because that is what the blood of Jesus has spilled that allows me to do in his name. Where is your brother and your sister? You have an enemy, and it's not other people. The circle expands one last time, at least, and it's to the world. That we have this sense of being called to locate our brothers and sisters in our neighbors and then in our enemies and in the world. By the way, these aren't stages of maturity. There are people that I know that are really good at loving the world but don't even know their neighbors' names. There are people I know that are really good at loving their enemies but don't really have a, a vision for the gospel in Honduras. And God invites us into this. We have ebbs and flows. Like we rarely have all these things going at once, but we pay attention to things to see where, where is God working through us and where are we neglecting the gospel in our lives. So these aren't stages of maturity, so be careful with that. There's this Hebrew term. I, I love it. It's the term tikkun olam. And it's the idea of repairing the world. That what we've been invited into is to think about how to participate in what God is doing in the world. Not to sort of say, I'm saved, I go to heaven someday, life back to business, back to business as usual. But to say, Lord, how do I get involved in the ongoing drama of your redemptive plan in this world? And what's interesting is that many civilizations throughout history are based on what's called fatalism. And it goes something like this. We accept injustice as if that's God's will. We accept suffering and violence, and poverty, and pain, because, well, that's just the natural way of this earth, and it's never going to improve. And we have kind of like a fatalistic view of that. 
And what the scripture and what tikkun olam, the idea of that, what it invites us into is moving beyond that to say, maybe I'm called to participate in what God originally wanted for this world and will fully bring in the second coming of Jesus. Nevertheless, we can see gains in that in ways today if I am to act, if I respond to need. So when it comes to this question, where is your brother? Throughout scripture, God invites people to rise and to act on behalf of another. That's tikkun olam. Maybe for you, I know for some in this room, it's a Title I school in North Charleston where you just got fed up with it and decided, I'm going to do something about that. I think about what Kate Taylor is up to with adults with autism and other sort of disabilities of stepping into that to say, I can do something about that. I can be a part of the redemptive plan. Or maybe for you, it's about digging wells for water in Kenya. For us as a church, we prioritize medical care in Haiti and your giving supports that. For us as a church, we prioritize orphan care in Honduras, and your giving here goes to that. That these are our brothers and sisters. They have a name. They have faces. They're not abstractions. They matter, and we do not believe that it is God's will for them to live in poverty. And so God says, come church, let's do something about it together. There's this archaeologist in our church who recently sent me a picture from 1958. This sign was located just outside the airport in 1958. So you think about our drive today of being, well, there's 526, so you never know. (laughs) On a good day, 26 minutes from here. But what if I told you that sign wasn't at that airport? but was it that one, nine miles away? In Mount Pleasant, close to where we sit today, can you imagine if we still accepted this? Must be the will of God. No. No, it's not. And we will act as the people of God on behalf of his people. Tikkun olam. That's the willing of God's people to act. So Rabbi Schneerson said to young Jonathan Sachs, you do not find yourself in a situation. You put yourself in one. And if you put yourself in a situation, you can put yourself in another Something was evidently wrong with Jewish life in Cambridge, and he was challenging Jonathan to act. This small encounter was the start of a journey that led to the formation of the most influential rabbi in the world. Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs would later write, We each have a role to play in strengthening the lives of others. I love this sentence. And the scale in which we do so does not matter. Can we just get clear about that? Can we just wipe comparison and competition off the table? Let me just start this again. We each have a role to play in strengthening the lives of others. And the scale in which we do so does not matter. If we make a positive difference to one person or another, that's enough. One life, said the sages, is like a universe. Therefore, if you change a life, you begin to change the universe in the only way we can, one person at a time, one day at a time, one act at a time, to offer help to those in need hospitality to the lonely or encouragement to those wrestling with difficulties is to do a holy deed. We can heal some of the wounds of this world. We can do something and we should never be discouraged that we can't do everything. Where is your brother? Where is your sister? I just would ask that you would 
invite the Holy Spirit to just name and locate one of these areas. Maybe it's for you, it's like being more intentional with the people around you every day, to ask better questions, to be more curious, to care. Maybe for you, it's, it's, it's the journey, it's the continued journey of healing from wounds and people that you've written off, that the Lord is wanting to heal in you, that you would be an agent at some point in time of healing in another. That's hard. Or maybe it's, it's getting involved with the mess of the world. Maybe it's jumping on a plane sometime this year and going. Or maybe it's giving in a way you've never done so before. Whatever that is for you. The invitation this morning is to simply invite God to say, would you reveal to me and locate my brother and my sister? So Holy Spirit, I pray across this room right now that you are putting names and faces that you are putting places and circumstances specifically, you are dropping them into our minds. Just see your hand like almost over each of us, just, just your fingertips, just releasing revelation into our minds. That you are clarifying what was before this moment obscure or abstract. You're bringing clarity. So Lord, I just pray that before we come to the table and receive from you, that you would rec- we would receive from you names and, and people that we can act and step into. So Lord, minister to us. Show us what you see. His presence daily live, and I surrender all, and I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. Jesus surrendered all first so that we would receive the blessing of his blood being poured out, as AJ said, that we would be able to surrender and it means something, and it does. 
My friends, during Lent, we are going to proclaim our story together through the Apostles' Creed. And so would you read this story with me? Our story. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we'll keep saying that because that is our story, but Jesus really encapsulates so much of that story. And so it's a way of looking forward towards Easter and towards um, really the greatest moment of history for us and for the world. My friends, the Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given things, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Holy Spirit, we are grateful. We're thankful today. We're thankful for the story that you have drawn us into that was part of your grander plan. We're grateful for that, God. We're grateful for how you see ahead. You know exactly what we need. And you knew what we needed when you gave up Jesus' life for us. And so thank you for uh, these elements before us. Lord, would you make it spiritually for us, the body and blood of Christ. We're grateful for how you do that in our lives. Amen. And let's proclaim the mystery of our faith today that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Would you stand as you're able? And let's pray the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I want to invite our servers forward. And as they come forward this morning, remember that if uh, your child is not uh, at an age taking communion yet, our servers would love to play, pray a blessing over them. Um, and even if you today don't want to receive communion, but you love to receive a blessing, they'd love to pray over you as well. So just keep your hands folded and we'll do that. So friends, come this morning ready to receive who you already are, the body of Christ.
you to take the throne of our lives today.
start with those questions. Take a note from Jesus, take a note from God and ask questions first thing and say, Lord, who is my neighbor? Who is my enemy? Who in the world do you want me to love and to see, to notice like you have loved, seen, and noticed me? Let's start our day off like that this week. Let's practice that during Lent. Can't go wrong. So friends, would you receive this benediction today? May the practice of honest confession and the joy of radical forgiveness set you free this Lent. God bless, friends.